We're going to turn now to national security. It's a week of showdowns and tough diplomacy. The world's biggest power, America's longest war, and that emerging nuclear deal with Iran all front and center. We have an exclusive interview with President Obama's former national security advisor, Tom Donnellan, coming up. First, here's some background from ABC's Mohammed Leela. One week changes it all. Last Sunday, news of a historic deal. U.S. and Iranian negotiators triumphantly returning home. Well, I think uh, this is an absolute win for both of us, for Iranians and for the other countries. In the streets of Tehran, we found signs of hope everywhere, from skateboarders who want Americans to visit. I hope the relation get better. To teenagers hanging out at a fried chicken joint. To raise your hand if you think you have freedom here in Iran. I guess. Yeah, freedom. <laughs> But this week, it's back to reality. Saudi Arabia, America's longtime ally, is nervous about the New Deal, and Israel is sending teams to Washington to lobby against it. All of this forcing Secretary Kerry to try reassuring Congress and those allies overseas the deal is narrow. So believe me, when I say this relief is limited and reversible, I mean it. And in neighboring Afghanistan, another foreign policy headache. The standoff between President Karzai and President Obama continues, despite a diplomatic full court press. After 12 years and more than 2,000 American troops killed, Karzai is refusing to sign a long-term security deal with the United States. A drone strike this week that reportedly killed a young Afghan boy, only making tensions worse. If the deal isn't signed, America says it'll pull all of its troops out next year. Meanwhile, off the coast of Japan, it's a symbolic fight. Take a look at this map. It's what China calls its new air defense zone. The Chinese announced any aircraft that want to fly through it need permission, even though the area covers two islands Japan says it owns. It's prompted this warning from America's new ambassador to Japan, Caroline Kennedy. Unilateral actions like those taken by China undermine security and constitute an attempt to change the status quo in the East China Sea. And George, when two American B-52 bombers entered that airspace this week, how did the Chinese respond? Well, they scrambled their own fighter jets to tail them. So in this case, the tension really is sky high. George. Okay, Mohammed, thanks very much. Let's bring in Tom Donilon now. Up until August, he was President Obama's national security advisor here for his first Sunday interview since leaving that post. Welcome to this week, Tom. Thank Let's you, begin George. with that, that cat and mouse game going yeah. on uh, in China. I think a lot of people look at that and say, why should we care so much about a couple of uninhabited islands in the East China Sea? Well, what we should care about are actions which uh, raise tensions in Northeast Asia. Uh, you have obviously major powers there, China, Korea, and Japan. And the Chinese have unilaterally undertaken a set of steps here, which instead of lowering tensions, increase tensions. And most importantly, George, they really do present the prospect of the, of the possibility of miscalculation and mistake. Remember in 2001, we had an incident where uh, you had a Chinese fighter pilot killed in a collision with a U.S. plane that had to land in China. And it's that risk of miscalculation and mistake that we need to be very very concerned about and going forward. In some forward ways, here. you saw something like this coming when you were the president's national security advisor. You were really put a lot of energy, a lot of time, and your personal time into this so-called pivot uh, to Asia. Should Americans get used to the idea now that China really is our number one rival in the world? Well, I'd look at it. I'd, I'd look at it this way: uh, is that Asia is a principal opportunity for the United States and the world going forward. Uh, our prospects and Asia's prospects are linked. It's the fastest growing uh, economic area in the world. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of opportunity there. And secondly, uh, for 60 years, the United States has provided the security platform on which Asia's social and economic development has been built. It's a critical role for the United States, and it's one that we should play going forward. And indeed, our decision at the outset of the Obama administration was that we should put more effort into this and provide uh, additional uh, effort and uh, um, um, security uh, in the region in order to allow it to go forward. Because they do a thought experiment. Do a thought experiment. Just in this current incident, if the United States weren't present, if the United States didn't take the actions that it's taken in terms of consulting and coordination, coordinating with our allies, having Vice President Biden go talk to the Chinese about leaving this. Leaving today. Leaving today. You could see tensions rising to a, to a really dangerous level. This has been a long time role of the United States, and it's one that we should continue to play and intensify going and forward. And it seems like the more the president and you tried to make this pivot to Asia, you're always getting drawn back into the uh, commitments we already have, including Afghanistan. Back in the news uh, this week, we saw your successor, Susan Rice, go over to Afghanistan, meet with President Karzai, trying to get this long-term security pact 
signed, yet he says now he's not going to do it, raises new demands to the United States. And, and, and again, I think the instinctive reaction of a lot of people is, fine, if he doesn't want to sign the security pact, we'll bring home our final 12, 8, 10, 12,000 troops. We don't need to be there if we're not wanted. Yeah. You know, uh, President Carter should go ahead and sign the agreement. You know, as we, you and I sit here uh, this morning, George, the United States has 51,000 troops in Afghanistan. Not on the front pages of the newspaper the way it had been in the past, but 51,000 troops. And casualties way down, though. Casualties yes. way down, and we are in the process of withdrawing from Afghanistan, and we hope to complete that. We will complete that mission by the end of December 2014. What this discussion is about is whether or not there should be any support, any presence of, of U.S. troops after 2014 inside, uh, inside Afghanistan. So why should there be? Uh, well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, President Carter should go ahead and sign the agreement. You know, it's been approved by a very large assembly of leaders in Afghanistan. 2,500 leaders got together, looked at the proposed agreement with the United States after December, uh, December 31st, 2014, uh, and, asked and, and uh, recommended to President Carter that he sign it. President Carter should sign it because I think it's in Afghanistan's interest and I think it's in our interest. That said, um, his refusal to sign at this point, I think, is reckless. I think it's reckless in terms of Afghanistan, uh, and I think it also adversely impacts our ability to plan coherently and comprehensively for a post-31st uh, post does the U.S. mean it when says, presence. fine, if he doesn't sign it, we really will well, pull everyone point, out? Well, at some point, George, it becomes impossible to make those kinds of plans, right? Uh, number one. Number two, yes, if the United States doesn't have a bilateral security arrangement with Afghanistan, uh, that supports its troop presence there and provides the kind of guidance and protections that we need, the United States cannot be present in Afghanistan after December 31st, 2014. And this has a cascading effect. Uh, if the United States isn't there, then the NATO allies uh, won't be there because the NATO allies rely on the capabilities that the United States provides. We won't have the same kind of support for the Afghan national security forces, and I think it'll impact non-security assistance as well. It's a very big point of, of, uh, point of decision here for the Afghans, for President Karzai. He should go ahead and sign the agreement, and if he doesn't, I think the United States will move towards plans uh, for so-called option B. And by the way, the United States has a lot of options with respect to being able to pursue its interests. Could that cost all the gains that have been made in this long war? We think that at the end of the day, it would be better to have continued support for the Afghan national forces and have a small counterterrorism and presence in Afghanistan. But again, as I said earlier to you, George, uh, the United States has a lot of options in terms of protecting its interests in the region. Let's talk about Iran. You also helped lay the groundwork for last week's nuclear deal with Iran, a temporary six-month deal. But even some of the president's allies in Congress have been quite critical of the deal, saying it, it just freezes the Iran programs, doesn't cause any rollback. And you saw President Rouhani of Iran in this weekend's Financial Times say that Iran is absolutely determined to maintain uranium enrichment sites, says it's 100% red line for his government. Mm -hmm. If they maintain that position, can there be a permanent deal that works with Iran? Well, he's laying on a maximalist position at this point as we begin the negotiations for a comprehensive agreement. And no, there's going to have to be rollback of the uranium program for there to have to be a comprehensive, for there to be a comprehensive deal at the end of the six-month uh, negotiation. But the interim steps are quite significant and I think positive in this way. Uh, they freeze the program in place. Uh, they roll back portions of the program, particularly the 20 percent enriched uranium, which is going to be neutralized. It provides intensive uh, monitoring, including in places where we hadn't monitored before. And it addresses something the Israelis have been very concerned about and we've been concerned about, which is the plutonium producing reactor at Iraq. It's a very good foundation to, uh, uh, to, as a backdrop against which to have comprehensive negotiations. I think it's a very solid achievement by Secretary Kerry and President Obama and the administration. Uh, and again, I think it's a very solid basis on which to go forward. The other thing it does, George, is this. The Israelis and we were concerned that if you opened up a negotiation with the Iranians, that they would use the pendency of those negotiations to advance the program and stall the negotiations. That's not going to be the case here because everything is frozen in place during the time the negotiations are underway. You know, one of the things we've seen, though, is that it's, it's created a lot of um, upset, not only in Israel, but also among our, our, some other allies in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia. And it feeds into a, a general perception among some of our adversaries, like Vladimir Putin, like the Saudis, that the president has been um, vacillating and weak. How do you respond to that? Well, I think that they, I, don't, I don't see how, in this case, you could call the president vacillating and weak. I mean, how did we get here with respect to Iran? We got here through a U.S.-led, very tough isolation and pressure campaign. The centerpiece of that campaign were the sanctions. 
Absent the United States led sanctions, which have been the toughest put on any country, uh, you wouldn't have a negotiation underway right now. You wouldn't have forced the choice. You wouldn't have, the, have had the election of Rouhani. There's a direct line here between the sanctions, Rouhani's election, and they're coming to the table. Why? Because we put tremendous pressure on the Iranian economy. We've also isolated the Iranians politically, and we have had a fairly major defense buildup in the region to indicate to the Iranians that all options are on the table. So this has been U.S. led, U.S. pressure campaign to bring the Iranians to the table. The test now is whether or not the Iranians can uh, do the things they need to do to assure the, the United States and the national community they don't have a, a, a dangerous problem. Finally, we're just about out of time. Let me ask fun, one final question about North Korea. We've seen these photos this weekend. Yeah. Merrill Newman, 85-year-old Korean War yeah. veteran detained uh, by the North Koreans. They're basically charging him with war crimes. Is there any way to deal with this country? Well, uh, what the North Koreans should do, of course, is release, uh, uh, release uh, uh, Mr. Newman uh, uh, right now. Um, uh, they've had the political theater, uh, and they should release him uh, in the interest of uh, a humanitarian gesture, his health, and the right thing to do. Uh, this is an exceedingly difficult regime to deal with going forward, and it presents an ongoing security challenge for the United States, the countries in the region, including China. Tom Donovan, thanks very much.